Who was not here this morning? Not here this morning. Hands high. What were you thinking? What's up? <laughs> so this morning we talked about sales. How to win new customers, how to grow the ones you got, how to differentiate yourself from the competition. Uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about a combination of culture and sales management. And uh, so let me give you my definition of those two. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about my style because we have a lot of new people here that weren't here this morning and need to understand my style and, uh, and, and a little bit about, about my background and then we'll get at it. Um, so culture. And I know Cameron Harold is a friend of mine and he came through and spoke here uh, a while back and he talked about culture. My definition of culture. Um, how, how to create an environment in my business where the people who work in it don't get up begrudgingly moaning about having to go to work and spend the rest of their days thinking about when am I going to retire, but rather they get up in the morning and say, hot damn, I get to go to work at that place. Because if you could create that kind of an environment in your business, that kind of a culture in your business, you'd have a competitive sustainable advantage. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, but I won't spend a lot of time on culture because Cameron spent time here and that was the gist of his, his talk. So he's covered it. I don't need to cover it as much. I'll just give you a little bit of my insight on it. All right. The main thing I want to talk to you about is sales management. Recruiting, training, coaching, building, developing a sales force. And I'll give you my first of many one-liners this afternoon. A sales manager's job is not to grow sales. A sales manager's job is to grow sales people in quantity and quality. And if you grow sales people in quantity and quality, they in turn will grow your sales. So one of the first things that I do when I go into a company is I want to know who has the responsibility for the sales management job. And then I want to know what percent of the time do they send selling and being in front of the customer or prospect, and what percent of the time are they recruiting, training, coaching, building, and developing salespeople? Because if you want to leverage the growth of your business, if you want to generate more revenue inside your business, in most businesses, the answer to that is to grow your sales force in quantity and quality. So let me tell you a story about one of my clients. 15 years ago, I found myself in New York City and I was speaking to 180 business owners and entrepreneurs. I spent eight hours with them in a hotel. This woman comes up to me at the end of my presentation, her name is Liz, and she says, hey Jack, can we spin off into the lobby here of the hotel? 15 minutes is all I need. Um, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and I just want to share some things with you about my company. And I said, well Liz, 15 minutes sounds pretty good. A cup of coffee, never had one in my life. And the people who know me say, nor should you. Um, so let's just go without the coffee and let's go. So we sit down and she says this to me. So I, I'm, my company is three years old. It's $4 million in annual sales. We have seven salespeople. But my vision is to be the biggest company in the world in our field. And I know I looked at her and smirked, smiled, or laughed. And I just said, really? So how, how are you going to do that? And then for the next 10 minutes, she proceeded to stun me. My jaw was on the table, and I looked at her, and I said, this is a really inappropriate question, but how old are you? You look like you're 15. She said, I'm older than 15. I'm just not 25 yet. And I said, yeah, but you're brilliant, and you're going to do that. And she said, yeah, but I just was in there for eight hours with you. I don't have a clue what you were talking about. I don't have any experience at any of that stuff. So is there a way that you can help me grow that company? So that was 15 years ago. Um, March of this year, uh, she called me up and she said, hey, listen, can you speak for three hours in Beverly Hills? Um, uh, I'm, I'm hosting my company's international sales management conference. Did you hear all those words? her international sales management conference of her company. And I said, that would be great. And so I came and she toasted me with a glass of champagne and she said, by the way, we're the biggest company in the world in our field 
And this past year, we did over $450 million in sales with 410 salespeople. Now, the reason that I tell you that story is this. If that day 15 years ago, Liz came up to me at the end of my session and said, I want you to teach my seven salespeople how to be the best salespeople that ever lived. If that's what I went in and did, she never would be where she's at today. Because this is what I learned about selling. There's only so many calls I can make. There's only so many calls I can take. And there's only so many orders I can write. Selling, which is what we talked about this morning, selling is a really important thing, but it's limited. It's limited to the amount of hours that you have, 168 hours total per week. We need to sleep, eat, and do other things. So it is a limited but important function. The way you leverage the growth of your business, if you're a business owner, is by growing your sales force in quantity and quality, and that's really what this afternoon is about. Recru recruiting, training, coaching, building, and developing salespeople, and building a culture in which they will automatically give it everything they've got. So that's really where I come from. Um, um, my style that I mentioned to the people that were here this morning is that I'm without PowerPoints, so I don't do PowerPoints as a style. Um, I scribble on that board from occasionally. Get get it down as quickly as I put it on there because my handwriting is awful and you won't be able to read it once it's up there. All right, so you gotta get it down in your workbooks. Everybody has a workbook. Um, if you take a look at the workbook just really quickly, like you're open to page number three. Um, page three is, is sort of a blank page if you look at that. Um, pa page four is a, another blank page. Um, page six, uh, we have another blank page. Page seven is a fairly blank page. And so there's a lot of blank pages in here. So what it means is that if you don't take good notes, the workbook is worthless. So that's really what I want. And what I want you to do is I want you to use your words in the workbook rather than mine. So whatever resonates with you and whatever makes sense. And there's so many businesses in the room that are different. I may say some things that will apply to some people and not to others. So therefore you can customize your workbook, okay? Um, page number two has a little bit of a background on me, and I'll tell you about me in, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, page two open. Um, I started selling at the age of seven. Owned the market, charged twice the price of every kid that I competed with. At 12, I built my first company, and at 13, I had five employees. They did all the work, and I kept 70% of the money, and I went on and took on another business opportunity while they were doing all that work. Um, at 13, I knew that I wanted to be a business owner when I grew up, and um, I went to school and learned how the numbers worked. I, I actually have a degree in accounting, uh, CPA, Arthur Anderson, all of that business. Never really aspired to be one of those cats, but needed to understand how the numbers worked so that I would employ my business correctly. And then I took that blank sheet of paper there six different times, and I uh, sketched out a business plan and convinced other people to buy into it, to join me and be employees. And we took every one of the companies nationwide. Very, very fast growing. Um, very, very profitable. Sold a couple of them to Wall Street. And um, by the age of 46, I had um, lost my passion for what I was doing. And so I, uh, I sold, the, sold the last company and um, was unemployed. My friends said that I was early retired. Uh, there's not a retirement stick inside this guy, so there is just no retirement in me. Last year I did four full Ironman, four half Ironman, seven marathons, um, 100, um, 130 speaking gigs, 225,000 air miles, and that's 20 years after I early retired. Uh, so I don't think that that's really in the cards for me. Uh, I, was, uh, I was blessed that I had a reputation built up in my industry, which was the money industry. I was in the financial services industry. And the phone started to ring when people heard that I was unemployed and said, can you come over for a day and help me here and here and here? And then somebody hired me to speak in an event and bang, that's when I found my passion again. I really enjoyed that. And so I came home to my wife um, and I said, gosh, Bon, I, 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 I haven't had this much fun in forever. <laughs> And, uh, and look at the size of the check they gave me for speaking. I'm going to do some more of this shit, huh? And uh, she said, God bless, just do something. Get out of the house. You're driving me nuts. So that's how I got into the speaking business about 20 years ago. And uh, we're really blessed with uh, great demand. 
If I wanted, I could speak 300 times a year. I'd have no life, no wife, no nothing. So we, uh, we manage it to be 130 max per year. We sell out 90% of the year by, uh, by October for the following year. So um, the people that work for me right now, they're selling 2016 and 17 and a few dates in 2015. So it's a really, really cool, satisfying thing. I have clients like Liz that I can tell you about all afternoon incredibly successful fast-growing companies. Um, I have salespeople that their incomes went from $50,000 to three, four, and $500,000 a year uh, practicing my systems and processes. Um, I have those success stories as well. Um, I, I am a real-world guy. I'm a business guy. And by the way, if you're here saying, hey, that Liz thing, forget it. I don't want a company of that size. Um, I don't want a company with nearly as many. My largest sales force was 2,600 salespeople in the United States. If you're in the mindset that says, I have no interest in that, hey, I'm a kindred spirit. I have, uh, I have the ability to build a speaking, training, and coaching company, and I could have hundreds of employees and be doing business all over the world. I have the demand and the supply both figured out. I could instantly make that company happen. It would be the worst day of my life. I have no employees, I have no office space, I come when I want, go when I want, I, hold, I have no responsibility to anybody, and every morning I wake up and say, don't screw this up. Okay? So, um, if you've ever heard the tale of the Mexican fisherman, um, I am the Mexican fisherman. And if you haven't heard the tale of the Mexican fisherman, just go Google Mexican fisherman entrepreneur and a, a great story about a guy that's an investment banker on vacation tries to convince the little uh, fisherman in Mexico to grow his business. And if he took it all the way to the degree that the investment banker was suggesting he took it, um, the Mexican fisherman at the end of the story says, um, why would I want to do that? I already have all of that right now as a little company. So um, understand what it is you're trying to build. Um, this morning we covered a lot of ground. The people that were here, would you say that is fair? Um, it, it, good, easy ideas that will go and be implemented and work. Absolutely. This afternoon, uh, I'm going to push you a little bit harder. Um, and I'm going to use a word right now that I didn't use this morning provocative. Um, I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone. If you're feeling like, wow, this is just a, I don't know about this, uh, then I'm doing a good job. So I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone, then I'm going to give you some stuff that will really work in scaling your business. Um, my, uh, my most recent book uh, was, was released on the 22nd of April. Um, Jerry, do you mind? Um, that many of you have, have gotten a copy of this. It's called Hyper Sales Growth. It's on culture, sales management, and sales. Um, and uh, I, I got to tell you, it's full of the stuff that you're going to hear here today and then some. Um, the book came out on the 22nd of April, and by the end of the day, um, Amazon had it rated as the number one best selling book in seven countries on its first day of release. Okay, um, real world stuff. Okay, with all of that being said, um, not in your book, so wherever you can, the back of each page is blank. Maybe you put the back of my bio on page two. Maybe you use that. Um, I want to catch the people up that joined us this afternoon that weren't here this morning. And uh, maybe, maybe as, as on that blank sheet of paper that you have, whatever that blank is, uh, maybe you fill it up with all this stuff. This is a bit of a review from this morning, but the reason I'm doing a bit of a review from this morning is this. These were systems and processes that I talked about this morning that we as sales leaders, sales managers, business owners, these are the things that we have to get our salespeople to be doing. And you inspect what you expect. These two kind of go together. Backward thinking. That was all about putting your goals in writing and having a written plan on how you're going to achieve the goals and a system of measurement and a system of accountability. 
and I went through it in, in more detail. That's as much as I'm going to cover this afternoon. We went, went through that this morning. But I will tell you, our experience is that the people that were here this morning that are in sales are going to leave here and they're not going to do this without someone making them. Okay? But, in my opinion, it's the number one thing that will make a difference in a salesperson's, act, in, in a salesperson's results and in a salesperson's revenue growth. A second system and process we talked about was pipeline management. Identifying your prospects, your customers, your clients. And then, regularly and ongoing, inspecting why the prospects are not turning into customers and why the customers are not turning into clients. And the difference between a customer and a client. A customer occasionally does business with you. A client regularly and ongoing does business with you and does a lot. Successful salespeople build what's called a clientele. There's a system and a process you can follow in order to make sure that those, those prospects turn into customers and customers turn into clients. And so these two sort of go together. And I mentioned prospects, customers, clients, but I'm gonna circle other. And we spent a fair amount of time this morning talking about the importance of other. Sometimes your very best customer will never buy or use your services, but they can be a center of influence and send you business a land office business and quite often is not called on by your competitors because they don't buy my stuff. All right? And so um, I, one of my businesses that I had was a residential mortgage lending company. We did home loans. But um, a real estate agent may not be my prospect, nor my customer, nor my client, but a real estate agent in that business is regularly and ongoing putting people in homes and can channel that business to me, the lender. So that might be one of the very best people in my pipeline to generate business and therefore leverage the growth of my business. But an awful lot of people will overlook them because when I ask who is your customer, they're giving me home buyers and homeowners and renters and all of the people that use the stuff. And don't overlook the other. The very first time, the very first time that you do business with somebody, you don't buy real value. You can't buy real value first time in. The first time you do business with them, you buy the perception of value. And so, the minimum price of admission to do business is to provide real value. I'm looking at these guys' hats, and it says the Garden Path Stone Center. So, uh, I don't know, we didn't talk, I don't know exactly what you do, but I got a sense uh, from the name that we've got some gardening going on, and we've got some uh, hardscape, softscape, that kind of stuff, right? Correct. All right. So, if I'm a homeowner, and you do, do, you do residential and commercial? Yes. Okay, so residential and commercial. But I will tell you whether I am a commercial customer of yours or a residential customer of yours, the very first time, let's call it residential, the very first time, so I buy a house and I want the entire backyard leveled and redone. All right? Um, that's a real world experience. Uh, I live in Southern California and we buy our houses differently than we buy them in the East. I grew up in the East. Um, in, in the East, the, a, a new home comes with a yard, right? Um, in Southern California, it comes with a plot of dirt. All right, there's no hardscape, no softscape, and the reason is, is because the weather is so grand out there that people spend a disproportionate amount of time in their backyards and in their front yards, and we create, in effect, additional rooms without a roof, right? And so massive amounts of money are spent on our yards. My, my, my wife redid ours, working with a firm like yours, spent somewhere around $300,000. Right? I've, I've got three 50-inch TVs out there and fireplaces and jacuzzis and bars and kitchens and I don't know what else. I mean, that's her side of the house. Yeah. I, I, we've been married 44 years and I know who the boss is, right? Mm -hmm. If she were to engage your company to come in and do that, and it was the first time, has no idea whether you're going to be able to pull it off. So. What, what she bought is the perception of value. 
So first time sales are based on perceived value. Now, what's interesting about that is that so many companies spend all their time delivering real value. But you miss the opportunity when you miss the perception of value. You should leave here having meetings in your company on how you're going to create perceived value. Perceived value. So like through branding? And through, through a variety of different things. Um, and um, it, 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 I, I'll tell you a great source. It would be um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Because um, there were two guys that created Apple. There was Woz and Jobs. And Woz was the guy who made the stuff. And Jobs was the guy who created the perception of value. Now, what's interesting about that, when you, build, when you build a business based on perceived value, now, don't get me wrong, you have to have real value. Otherwise, you won't get repeat and referral business, you'll be out of business. But, but when, you, when you create perceived value, the companies and the salespeople that do that, um, price doesn't matter any longer. In what the press tells us has been the worst economy in the la in, since the last dis depression for the last six years or so, uh, according to the press. I'm not buying everything. The pr press doesn't sell positive stuff. They only sell negative, right? Um, airplanes. I think it's amazing that they stay up in the air. With all the people and all the weight and everything else. It's a fascinating thing for me. And, you know, I'm up in them quite often. I'm 200 flights a year on average, right? So it's, it's encouraging me that the stats are better in the air than they are in your car, okay? Now, um, I think if you've ever seen a map of the United States, during the day, the amount of airplanes that are in the sky, it is amazing that we have sunlight down here. That's how much metal is hanging up there. So the newspaper each day should read, we sent them all up and they all came down safely. Now. What's the day that we read about an airplane? Crash. The day it crashes. See, it's all about negativity. So in the last six years, according to the press, it's been negative in the economy. Now, um, during that same time period, Apple Computer became the most highly valued company in the world. They're about number three right now. This is the best part. How many laptops could I buy of a competitor for the price of one Apple laptop? H how many? Three, four. Three to four. It's four. Generally speaking, four. But if I went into, if I went into an Apple, let's see, this morning, remember I taught prospects, customers, and clients, and I said what you should really go for is clients. Remember that? Steve Jobs made me antiquated. He said, why would you stop at clients? Build a cult. If I went up to the cult member of Apple and said, I got four laptops for your one. You want to trade? What do they tell me? People will go out of their way and pay a premium if you create enough perceived value. So, you want to jot down a few names under perception of value? Here's some companies, and I can't give you individual people, but I can tell you individual salespeople have perceived value, okay? You just wouldn't know them. I, I, know, I know people that have it, but you, the names wouldn't mean anything. So, I'll just give you companies. Um, Apple's one. Tiffany's is one. Not many Tiffany stores around, but people will go out of their way and pay a premium to go to shop there. Starbucks. You'll wait in line for a Starbucks cup of coffee. They make them individually. They write your name on the side of the cup. And they'll charge you $6 for that opportunity. Now, I've never had a cup of coffee, but I'll tell you, uh, I don't even know what, where'd you learn the language? I don't even know what you're ordering. Coffee used to be with or without cream and sugar, right? Uh, what happened to those days? So Starbucks built this thing, thousands and thousands of stores all over the world. But what's, what Howard Schultz said is, I'm not selling coffee, I'm selling an experience. I don't have any office space, but if I needed to hire another one of my independent consultants that supports me, I could have hour interviews every hour on the hour 
and have them stop by the Starbucks store near my home and I would just take a table or a couch there with another chair and they bring them in and nobody gives me any problem whatsoever. They'd love for me to stay there all day. And they'll provide me free Wi-Fi in case I cut the interview short and it's a beautiful experience. Um, and so um, the, the watch industry uh, has figured out perception of value. Name the watch company that I'm thinking about. Rolex. Rolex see? And so, how many Rolex stores in the last five years in the United States do you think have gone out of business during this terrible economy? Zero. Wouldn't you think that they'd be rushing to the smaller price items, but what we're finding is the higher priced items are doing really well. But the higher priced items, the salespeople in the company have created perceived value. Harley Davidson. You want a Harley Davidson bike? It's an inferior bike to a half a dozen brands to compete with it. Sorry if you're a cult member of Harley, I offended you, but that's the truth. Um, you'll wait six months to get your bike built and delivered. You could get it this week from a competitor. That's called going out of your way for perceived value. And General Motors has to sell seven cars to make what Harley makes on one bike. So it'd be really worth your while to, rent, to run the table on perceived value. And then I talked about the importance of having a touch system. And it takes nine touches before people know you exist and most salespeople quit at five or less. And I spent time talking about the touch system this morning as well. I spent time talking about so much of this stuff and the two words that I used were systems and processes. And what I encourage the people that attended this morning is to build the systems and processes to ensure their success there. Um, I am just telling you my experience has been when I had salespeople in my companies and in the last 20 years doing what I do now, as soon as I let them out the door, the majority of them are not going to do it. So it requires the people in this room to do that, to ensure that they do these things. But where I want to go is on page number three now. And now we go into new territory. So people attend these sessions, they hear about my clients' successes, they hear about my company successes, and afterwards somebody will kind of pull me aside and say, hey, um, what, do you think, what do you think the cause of these successes were? What do you think the secret is? And so I, I, I got tired of answering that for one person out of 50 here today. So I'm going to give it to you on this page. There are three big things in building a business that you really need to knock down. The first one is vision. Understanding what it is you're trying to build. Imagine you, sit, you, you living in the house next to mine and I live in a little town called San Clemente. It's a beach community in Southern California just before you get to San Diego. To give you a sense of what our community is like, um, our city has won for 11 consecutive years the National High School Surfing Championship. It's pretty laid back there, right? Imagine living in the house next door to me and you look outside your window and I'm loading up my car with luggage. The trunk is full of luggage, and now I'm throwing luggage in the back seat. You come out next to me at the car and you ask, Where are you, doing? Where are you going? Where are you going? East. Where east? I don't know yet. How, how, how long are you going to be? I don't know that either. How, how much are you budgeting to spend? Don't know that either. I, I just thought I'd get in the car and make it up as I go along. Want to come? <laughs> I think you go back into your house and say, Jack's lost his mind. Mm -hmm. Do you know that when I run into so many business owners, that's what I feel like they're telling me their vision is? I'm just making it up as I go along. What do they do with their employees? Follow me! Where are we headed? I don't know, I'm just making it up as I go along. 
definition of vision. Something that gets people inside your company and outside your company excited about what your company is doing. Um, Cameron, who was here, called it the painted picture. Could you paint what that company looks like down the road? Every one of the companies I built was built for sale. What does it look like at the very end? What's it look like five years from now? What's it look like ten years from now? Some key words that I used, magnetic and compelling. And once you have clarity about what it is you're trying to build, here's what I would tell you. You can't talk about it and share about what that company is. You can't do that enough with your people. Regularly and ongoing have discussions, talks about what the vision is. You got to keep in mind what we're trying to build here is this. What I'm trying to build here is this. What is this? Something that gets me bouncing out of bed and says, let's go do this thing. Let's go make this happen. Stephen Covey said it this way, begin with the end in mind. Vision.